Today we are talking about the V word. Yes, vaccines for our companion animals. It is always a hot topic for many reasons. One being that we want to do what is best for our pet and asking questions about what is perceived to be the status quo is a difficult pill for many to swallow including our veterinarians. So today we're talking to Dr. Lori Kozier. Dr. Kozier is an integrative and functional medicine veterinarian, dog owner, trainer, and breeder. Her resume is quite impressive, but it's her matter-of-fact delivery that makes me like her even more. Anytime I'm in need of referring someone to information regarding vaccinations for their pets, Dr. Kozier and her website, Healthy Dog Workshop, is one of the first I reference. So I thought it was fitting to have her on the show today to help break down this often controversial topic. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Kozier. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I think the logical place to start is with the current vaccine schedule for our dogs and cats and why it isn't working. As a pet parent, you face more challenges with your dogs and cats today than ever before in history. What's the best food to feed? How do I prevent illness and help them live longer? Maybe you currently have a pet living with disease or behavioral issues and you need a different approach for success. Welcome to the Pet Health Junkies podcast. We're so happy you're here. Pam Roussel is a holistic health practitioner specializing in holistic health for animals. Janet Cesarini is a healthy pet store owner and advocate for health through nutrition. Jessica Fisher is a pet parent coach and positive reinforcement dog trainer. Join us as we share our stories, experiences, and all that we've learned to change the way we think about raising our pets. We're breaking it all down and making it simple by sharing how we help pet parents just like you every day. Because when we know better, we can do better. Um. <laughs> We're just going to jump right in there. Jeez, I don't know where to go from that. That's such an <laughs> open question. Uh, <laughs> because things aren't working on so many levels. Mm -hmm. So what, you know, what is your first way that it isn't working? For you, for your dogs, what do you think? It's so, really... Yeah, okay. no, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to maybe... Um, Clar clarify the question a little bit. I think for the average pet parent, for the 2.0 pet parent, right? Okay. I think we're all on board with the current vaccination schedule isn't working for our pets. For the average pet parent, the pet parent that is just trying to get through life and they love their pet, but they're just, this is what my vet says, this is what my vet says, this is what my vet says. Putting a little bug in, like, what, what is that first bug that we would want to put in their ear that, hey, we might want to question this? Yeah. I, I guess the first bug I would put in their ear is, you know, aside from COVID and now flu vaccines that are, that are being promoted, you know, we're in, a, we're in a really strange time in the world. When was the last time you got a vaccination? You know, after your childhood. I guess right. that was the first question I'd, I'd ask, you know, have you been vaccinated against polio or diphtheria recently? Right. And <laughs> that, that makes, they pause because they honestly can't remember. Right. Typically they were little kids. It's um, not logical. It to isn't keep doing logical. it. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, they, the human medicine has planted the idea that these childhood vaccines are good for life. You know, maybe they'll say tetanus you need to get every 10 years or what have you. Um, and then, of course, whatever the current pandemic is. But otherwise, human medicine tells us these childhood vaccines are good for life. So right. what's different about our pets? I'm so glad you said that because that is exactly what sparked me to question why I was taking my cats in every year. Mm -hmm. for, for vaccines. And I, I came home one day after doing that. This was many years ago. And they were all puny and sick for like, you know, 24, 48 hours. And I just sat there and I felt so bad. And I thought, 
why am I doing this? I don't get vaccines every year. Why do they need vaccines every year? So that was, that's, I'm so glad you said that because that does make people stop and, and question, well, wait, you're right. I yeah. don't do that. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and human medicine is very different than veterinary medicine. You know, both are reactive instead of proactive, mm-hmm. but, yeah. um, you know, they use thinking of the person who goes and steps on a rusty nail. Yeah. People know, oh, I should get a tetanus shot because I might have had exposure. But they just now just linked risk and reason together, or risk and benefit. And nobody does that in veterinary medicine. Mm-hmm. Right? Why is that, do you think? They're not trained. Training could be a part of it. But I think we fall into habits and we fall into we being veterinarians in general. Um, the reminder date that's on our little record says we need to do this on this date. And we just, we see the instruction typed out on our medical record and we follow it without thinking, Mm -hmm. oh, this dog is due for A, B, and C. So I go get A, B, and C out of the fridge and do it. And it just, it goes on autopilot. Yeah. And until you as a veterinarian have had an experience that makes you question or received training that makes you question you don't question. Mm-hmm. You don't you think know, it was outside a big the box. Thing when uh, veterinarians started to accept that a distemper parvo could last for three years, because that was initially that was a hard battle, and <laughs> largely I think because a lot of veterinarians treated parvo puppies and a lot of them died. Yeah, and you know it was a very, very challenging time to get through that, and they were so afraid that the vaccine might not work and they would be dealing with another parvo case that they couldn't accept. Oh, it lasts three years. And now I think the American animal hospital association is up to five years, which is really good because we know it's nine to 15 by science. Wow. So we're inching our way towards that in conventional medicine. It's a big gap. Interesting. It is a big gap. It is. But it's a hell of a lot better than one year. Yeah. Yeah. You know, speaking of for the totally traditional vets, uh, the other problem, I think, is, you know, 70% of the revenue spent in this country on veterinary medicine is going into corporate practices. So your Banfield, your VCAs, your the big business. entities. And what do those companies do? They put in, they sell you a wellness package. They sell you the silver plan, the gold plan. And the first thing that those things contain are five vaccines. And... Mm. You know, so again, it becomes an autopilot situation of the person bought the package, they get these vaccines, whether they need them or not. And they think they got a great deal when they really bought something they didn't need. Um, And the corporation's happy because the average transaction charge is what it is. And they sold this many wellness plans. Mm -hmm. So do you think it's all come down to in cases like that where it's all about the profit and the bottom line instead of care? I don't think it's totally about the profit. And certainly the average private vet, not speaking non-corporate, right. he's not thinking, he or she is not thinking, I need to give this vaccine to increase my bottom line. They're truly, they truly believe that it's indicated for that patient. The I do question the corporate things, the wellness packages and stuff, because there's no way, you know, the 12 year old Cocker Spaniel who stays at home on the couch all day mm-hmm. needs a kennel cough and influenza board, a, t- uh, a Lyme, a Lepto, right. you know. Right. But the person the person was marketed to that. This is our best deal. You get all this for the low cost of ninety nine ninety nine. So they buy it. Yeah. And there's no. You know, there's, I bought the package, I get the package. There's no thought process and discussion in between. Mm -hmm. That model Mm -hmm. is very scary. Um, It takes the thinking out of it. And it's, um, you know, it does. It it, it makes us the thinking out and it's, you know. Yeah. Sorry. It's almost like your, the car, the car warranty or the extended warranty you buy and your appliances, Mm -hmm. you know, it's. That's all it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's really scary to me that people just don't stop and think. 
Mm-hmm. And that's, that's what's <laughs> that's happened. What's <laughs> the average consumer is trained to trust the professionals that they've chosen. Yes. And, yes. and the professional has the training they've had and they have their core beliefs. Um, you know, the only thing I will, I will say unequivocally is I don't know a veterinarian who got into it um, to harm animals to make no. profit. And it really mm-hmm. angers me when that, that argument is put forward that they're selling you prescription food or they're giving you these vaccines or drugs so that you'll be coming back with a sick animal. Because that's simply not the case. Right. Yeah, it's certainly not intentional on the on the part of the veterinarian. I don't think. I think there could be intention, possibly, <laughs> or at least lack of care in the part of the pharmaceutical companies. Um, that is very much a profit profit driven model. So the oh level God. of caring is is so much less. Well, and again, they can care, but they believe what they believe, and they believe this is the best way. And they're allowed to be right and they're allowed to be wrong. Um, mm-hmm. You know, but so, the pressure to uh, let's take Apoquil or Atopica, the two most popular allergy meds. Mm-hmm. And the most frustrating condition in dogs, the chronically allergic itching dog that's keeping you up and aggravating you. And, you know, they dangle that carrot in front of you and say, our drug, our drug solves it. Right. And it doesn't matter if your drug has a 33% rate of causing cancers. There are owners who are going to choose that because they can't handle the other side. And if the drug company isn't lying, it solves the problem. I yeah. believe it creates a worse one, but, mm-hmm. you know, as do we choose for themselves. Yeah. Pam, Pam yeah. And, and well, all three of us, we deal with a lot of that. And mm-hmm. in our environment we always have to remind the pet parent that we can give you a band-aid or we can help you with a long-term solution to actually help your you heal your pet so that we are not taking you know hopefully down the road you you can get your pet off of those types of drugs because going back to the the thought that we said a little bit earlier about we the system has taken the thinking out of it and, mm-hmm. you know, especially me, with my teaching background, you know, critical thinking was always part of, you know, your lessons and right. um, you can apply it everywhere in life, regardless of what you're looking at. And so we've taken that away and we're not able to analyze and make a logical, sensical decision Um and like you said, sometimes when you even present the facts about what I can give Apoquel, and that was the trigger for my Hank that I mentioned to you before we started. Um, he was recommended to have a Cytopoint shot put on Apoquel and also put on Hills Science Diet Satiety Diet um, recipe. And does that ring a bell? This, this was many years not, ago. Not, not or, by that name. Okay. And it was probably, it was, it may have been called something else, but I remember the word satiate. And, um, yeah, I just, I, I wanted to know the why and how things worked and I wasn't satisfied with the answer. And I'm saying this to our audience because we're talking about, um, taking a step back and thinking and doing, doing the thinking for your pet, you know, is what is necessary what is not necessary you don't have to make a decision right then and there i was Mm -hmm. at the vet clinic this morning and i heard the front desk um, personnel talking to a pet parent who was at checkout and she was going down the list he's due for this he's due for that um he's due for this one but you don't have to do that one and I wanted mm-hmm. to talk to the gentleman so badly yeah. and, and give him some advice, unsolicited advice is never <laughs> taken well. Um, it's a bad, it's a bad idea. Yeah, it is a bad idea. So I was <laughs> like, no, idea. Janet, just do your business you know, <laughs> and get out of here. But, but I was listening to that yeah. um, conversation and that goes on every day, multiple times a day with multiple people across mm-hmm. America. So um, it does. It does. You know, I think that 
Well, and, and my question for you was when we talk about necessary vaccines, you know, in your opinion, which ones are necessary and how, mm-hmm. how should we prepare them, their bodies beforehand and even after, you know, we taught, we have things um, that remedies natural, of course, that help support liver and kidney um, that we recommend in our, um, my shop. I know Pam does as well. And Jessica is working on, on her shop. And I know she's coaching people to get things to help support organs. Um, but what is your opinion, Dr. Kozier? Hmm. It's a big um, question. Well, I always start with, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I always start with reminding people that every vaccine carries a label. And what we, when we say label in the trade, we mean the indications and the uh, directions for giving it, if you will. Mm-hmm. And on the label of every vaccine, it's going to say for administration to healthy animals. So if yes. you cannot say that your animal is healthy, then you have no business giving a vaccine. That would be what's called an off-label use. And it's something we try to avoid. So, you know, your dog that's in the clinic for an ear infection, is that the time to give him a vaccine? No, Mm -hmm. he's not healthy. Or she's in there and has been vomiting for, you know, a couple days. Seems okay now, but maybe not 100%. Not the time to give a vaccine. Mm -mm. So my patient selection is my first criteria. And of course, what do we do to prepare the body for anything? We feed it well, we exercise it, we try to make it as strong as possible. So, you know, from that standpoint, is the animal eating good food? And for me, that's a well-designed fresh food diet that's not Mm -hmm. eatable. Um, Is it, is the animal optimally exercised in good body condition, free from parasites or other health challenges? Mm -hmm. Yes, I can say, okay, you're a candidate for vaccination. Then I need to say what vaccines are important in your lifestyle. So there's a lifestyle assessment. You know, does your dog go boarding, grooming, daycare? Uh, is it a couch potato? Um, you know, what what are the natural exposures? Do you live in the city where there's loads of parvo, or you're on the farm and parvo isn't a concern, but there's lots of wild animals around, so rabies would be your top concern. Mm-hmm. So there's going to be a lifestyle assessment and that's going to prioritize the order in which vaccines are given and whether an individual vaccine is given. Now, rabies is a special case in that it's legally mandated in all 50 states. So you're not going to get out of that one, nor do I necessarily think you should if your animal is normal. Because I've seen rabid animals in the city. I've seen them in the woods. And... You don't want to get caught with your pants down, so to speak, (laughs) because you're going to encounter the rabid animal at the time you least expect it. For example, in the waiting room of the veterinary hospital I work at, um, one January day, upstate New York, you know, it's sleeting rain out in the middle of the day. It's lunch hour. And two women walk in with a large shopping tote. And luckily, nobody else in the waiting room at that time because it was lunch break. And they inform us that they have a raccoon that was hit by a car and they want us to treat it. Now, in upstate New York, on a sleeting, disgusting January day, the raccoons are all holed up. And this one was stumbling along the side of the road trying to beat up garbage cans. Now, that was a rabid raccoon till proven otherwise. And these women picked it up. put it in a shopping tote and drove it to our hospital. How they did not get bit, I have no idea. Wow. (laughs) But, you know, and it's like, um, you know, we're in upstate New York. We have wildlife and there are constant public service announcements everywhere. If you see wildlife that does not run away from you, run away from it because that is not normal. Don't disturb them. Um, It was mind boggling. and, And there was no evidence of, any in, external injury to the raccoon. So from my point of view, he was rabid and the health department of course said, yes, please safely euthanize it and don't get bit. Wow. 
But, you know, does every dog need at least one rabies vaccine? Yeah, I think so. Because so then you never know who's going to walk into your building with a rabid raccoon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about titer testing? What about titer testing? Titers, yeah. Um, that's a big discussion. So uh, <laughs> do you want to go there now or do you have something else you want to do first? Probably go somewhere else. <laughs> <I'm first. right. laughs> so let's, can, let's can, jump. Yeah. Let's jump back to the then. second part of that question about detoxing okay. after vaccinations. Yeah. So I'm one of the people who does not automatically detox because I'm supporting health proactively before I'm so pro- supporting health proactively in an, an individualized manner after. Mm-hmm. So in a sense, you could say I'm always detoxing my dogs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're eating a fresh food diet. They're getting appropriate omega threes. Uh, they may be on, you know, depending on their age and risk factors, they may be on some other supplements, probiotics. If I don't, if I don't think their microbiome is strong. So I'm not one of the people who automatically gives a vaccine and then says, okay, now you got to go take your 3F for five days. Mm -hmm. Um, That, for anybody who doesn't know, is a homeopathic traditional vaccine remedy. The problem is I'm not a homeopath, but the ones I've worked with are classically trained, and they do not practice homeopathy with product A is the treatment for condition B. And they totally tailor it to what the patient, human, or animal is doing, what they call the symptom picture. So it's a Western medicine thing to say we treat this condition with this drug. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stick to you know clean living, if you will. Yeah. Um, with appropriate diet supplements, you know, if I had a dog that was weak in the liver and I gave a vaccine or any other stressor. I might, yeah, reach for a a, a paddock support product like milk thistle or one of the commercial combos. But I'm going to tailor it to what that dog's body is, not so much what I had to have injected into them. Mm -hmm. Do you follow that approach? mm -hmm. Yeah, I I agree with that approach. And I'll throw a scenario um, into the mix here. And is I think this would probably fit many people that are listening, you know, most, the majority of people feed kibble and Mm -hmm. what, you know, our mission collectively is to try to um, influence our pet parents to become more proactive. And, you know, in my store, we focus on proactive um, wellness. And so we talk to customers about, um, you know, what's in the freezer. We have 11 mm-hmm. freezers in my little store. Nice. And that's, I, my dream is to become a freezer store is what I call it. And mm-hmm. um, just talk about adding fresh and, you know, I guess and right, right or wrong. Um, I kind of come at each situation as we're helping our customers. The majority of them have never given supplements and when I say that, not even pre and probiotics other than the little box of Fortiflora from that Perina makes that every vet gives you when you put your, yes, I fell prey to the $40 box many times before I entered into, um, and, and stage. We'll say that, that Fortiflora is, uh, the, the, the helpful bacteria are suspended in a powder made from animal digest. Mm -hmm. Just imagine, if you can, what animal digest is. Yeah. It's gruesome. It's it's hard stuff. Yeah. And yeah, let's feed our dogs that. Let's put that in our body. Yep. I'm going to get this with the antibiotic. And then after the 14 packets are gone, I'm done. I never give Mm -hmm. my pet pre and probiotics again until you step foot in our store. And we talked to you about the gut biome. And so I think, Mm -hmm. you know, I think all the three of us and some of our listeners are going to agree with what you're saying about being proactive with diet and nutrition, but speak Mm -hmm. to the, the pet parent that's not there yet. 
you know, what would that look yeah. like if they were coming and, you know, to and, Hi, buddy. Well, and if, you know, to the pet parent that's not there yet, but is asking a question, you know, gold star, because you're questioning, you're asking, you're wanting more information. And it's because you want the best for your pet. Yes. Um, I think my profession and the pet food industry um, and probably some other pet professionals have trained owners very well to not add anything to the bowl. Do not give your dog <laughs> table food. Do yes. not you yes. know, feed your dog from the table. It's people food. It's like, uh, no, it's food. And yes, don't give your dog a pepperoni pizza. Right. Yes. But you know what? Small bits of clean mozzarella cheese are healthy. Mm -hmm. Vegetables are healthy. Clean proteins are healthy. And those can be added to the bowl. Because believe me, what's in that kibble is not the quality of what you, you're going to put on your plate. Yeah. There is a difference between what is food, which is what humans eat, and what is feed, which is what animals eat. And the reason we have so many recalls, including, I want to say, like 82 million pounds of kibble last year, is because we've used moldy corn in it, yeah. moldy mm -hmm. vegetables. Like and meat that did not pass USDA inspection, which means the animals were diseased, the meat was compromised. You know, mm -hmm. it is that is not wholesome food. Mm -mm. And, no. But you know, the what is the what is Purina or I shouldn't I won't pick on any particular brand because they all do it. The Acme Pet Food Company yeah. tells you do not change your dog's food because oh my god they'll get it that stomach or diarrhea, and do not add anything because you'll throw off the nutritional balance. Really what that's, that's saying is feed more of our product and keep buying it. That's an oxymoron to throw really off the is. balance, the net nutritional balance, because there's no yeah. nutrition in it. And if your dog gets diarrhea or a stomach upset when you're switching food, that is just screaming, we need to work on the gut biome. <laughs> yes. We need to, and we need to work on the right. dog natural enzyme and the digestive enzyme. Digestive enzymes. To yeah. optimize it to, for flexibility and to be able to produce enzymes to digest any component in any ratio. Yes. 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 Yeah, you know, that's like prop, props to their marketing for so many decades because, like you said, I, you know, I go into somebody's home for a, you know, and, the first time I ever meet them to train their dog and they're so proud to tell me they never give their dog human food. And yep. I'm just sitting here like, bless your heart. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, I used to be there too. Like yeah. Fluffy, Fluffy never gets table food. It's like, why not? Yeah. It's just yeah. Fluffy. You know, a vegetable never harmed anybody. Mm -mm. <laughs> and a fresh piece of meat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. bigger. Yeah, but but the marketing is incredible, and even though we're supposed to be talking about vaccines, I I kind of see that we're going to have to talk more than once because we won't get through everything. <laughs> um, how about the Super Bowl? The Super Bowl commercial. Oh yeah, the first the farmer's dog. dog. Yes, that generated so yes. much um, so much interest. Okay. It generated a, a bunch of rants from veterinarians who mm -hmm. don't know, gee, you know, this is actually formulated by formulators who know their stuff, despite the fact that they're not on the permanent payroll. They were paid on a consultancy basis. You know, I don't right. The whole, oh, my God, you must have a nutritionist on staff is total BS because, truthfully, the people who are really good at it, freelance. Mm. They work for multiple companies and... They're, they're always available. Mm -hmm. Why do you have to pay them every week? Right. But that commercial, I think, opened eyes that had never thought about feeding fresh food to dogs. And I know they invested five and a half million dollars in that commercial. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, good on them. Good. good on them, yes. Yeah. They, it was they opened eyes and it was it, excellently done. It was. It was. It tugged at the heartstrings. And we have seen mm -hmm. a um, spike in more people coming in 
and wanting to talk to us about transitioning. I know it's like (laughs) transitioning their pets off of kibble. So, uh, Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. Yeah. It's exciting. And you know, it used to be, we could take the kibble dogs and switch them to a grain free and see a real improvement. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't happen because the grain free carb content has gone back up, but switching them to one of these foods, you'll see a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And the biggest segment is those skin dogs, which are the ones that are really frustrating for people to live with. That, and we see a lot of the um, overweight dogs do so well. Once we switch them to fresh, they drop the weight and, and Mm -hmm. just, they're like puppies again. And yeah, it's awesome to see. It really is. And these these skin dogs, oh, I'm sorry, please go. I said, I was, I was just so thrilled that, you know, farmer's dog took that and ran with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. These skin dogs, I mean, you can't even, you can't do a proper rotation and elimination diet on, you know, any, re- really any commercial, commercially available foods to no. begin with. So I think that's a great, like, headway into, by the way, let's continue to feed them these real foods. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know about the uh, class to action suit against Nutrish, right? No. The Rachel Ray Nutrish, the one that had the um, dog DNA in it? Yeah. Yes. yeah. So it was a quote-unquote limited ingredient diet, supposed to be just six ingredients, and it was a lamb and rice formula. So a woman bought it because it said no corn, wheat, and soy on the label, and her dog had sensitivities, and the dog did not do well on the food. And she must have had a friend that was a lawyer. They had... Uh, next generation DNA sequencing done on it, which is both tells you both the species and the percentage of Mm. uh, that component in the food. Mm -hmm. So it was supposed to be like lamb and rice and a few other things and then vitamins and minerals. And I want to say the ingredient list went up to like 30 or 40. And there was corn, wheat and soy in there. There was dog in there. There was horse in there. Uh, Chicken, mm-hmm. turkey, beef, you know, other proteins. Mm-hmm. There, there were an assortment of plants in there, trout. The thing that got me beyond the horse and the dog was zebra fish. You know, the little striped fish you put okay. in your tropical aquarium? Aren't those poisonous? poisonous? Not, that I, not that I know of. Well, okay. not. No, nobody. Okay. Not Never mind. You're thinking puffer fish. No, they're about an inch long. And they have horizontal black and white stripes. Yes. Um, but, you know, this is a fish that's this long. And you they measured DNA, a measurable quantity from it, in a kibble. Now, mm-hmm. I did do a little research and found out that that is a pop- popular laboratory fish. Mm-hmm. And evidently, uh, it's some of its cellular processes are similar to humans. And, of course, its life cycle is fast. It a- lays eggs very easily. So they're using it in the labs, and I guess they dispose of the excess in at a rendering plant where it goes into pet food. Okay. But when you look at that list of ingredients, there is no kibble diet that's available that's going to not contain potentially what your dog is sensitive to. So yeah. the al- industry alternative is the hydrolyzed diet mm-hmm. where it's really just chicken and corn but it's just so super ultra processed. The body doesn't recognize it. Or soy. That's something I'm interested in feeding. Yeah. And you know, my, my dog has been, I know exactly what she has eaten ever since I adopted her, but she was about two and a half when I adopted her. Mm -hmm. And I recently did a glacier peaks life wellness scan on her, which of course, you know, you have to take with a little bit of a grain of salt, right? The, The results, but she had it, it showed a sensitivity to kangaroo. And I'm like, where in the world has she ever had kangaroo? Right. Yeah. I mean, unless, unless it was made at a co packer as the Nutrish is, Nutrish was then made at Ainsworth Pet Nutrition and they process all sorts of stuff, which is how all sorts of stuff got in the food. It's in there. Um, but of course. I mean, I've- I've never fed her kibble a, a day I've had her, but uh, you know, who knows what she had before I, I adopted her. So I was just like, it blew my mind. I'm like, where has she had kangaroo before? 
if it's true. Right. Um, yeah. Right. Generally, my nutrition test of choice is NutriScan. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that has more accuracy. NutriScan. But, uh, NutriScan, mm-hmm. yeah, from Dr. Dodds. Dr. Dodds. Oh, oh. Um, it's a so, saliva-based test. Mm-hmm. Going back just a few minutes, Jessica, you mentioned sure. working with your clients and especially those skin and coat dogs um, and how you try to pull them off of especially kibble, but start, you know, home cooking and then, you know, moving them if they want to go to a commercially prepared, you know, complete and balanced fresh diet. So I took a webinar yesterday or listened to a replay of Dr. Besant and her Medicus line Mm -hmm. of fresh pet foods. And I'm pretty impressed, Um, but she has Mm -hmm. uh, one for skin and coat. And, you know, she was talking about going through that process of, you know, putting them on that temporarily and then transitioning to another gently cooked or, you know, complete raw diet. But um, Mm -hmm. because I think you had mentioned. Yeah, because she's using, I think, guinea fowl and bison liver. So those are. She's using, yeah. Proteins that most dogs probably haven't come into contact with before. Yeah, very novel proteins. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So am I going to get us back on track? (laughs) Yeah, back to vaccines. You or Pam? So, well, the the, um, not as healthy, proactive, you know, maintained pet goes in. We don't know a lot of times if they have an underlying condition. So, I mean, right. I I have a question. It's a personal question, but with a dog that has lipomas, a senior dog that has multiple lipomas, would you consider them a candidate for the rabies vaccine that they supposedly need by law? You, I know it's a law um, every three years. Right. Is that I mean, normally to be- yes, but okay. that's that lipomas are not going to pass muster as a reason for an exemption. And most states do provide for a valid medical reason why you're not going to follow the state law. They allow for that. We're not required to harm our patients, but that that is subject to review by the state veterinarian, and no state veterinarian is going to say lipomas are a reason to not vaccinate a dog. A risk. Mm-hmm. Now, you, know, you say it's lipomas. Were they all aspirated or were they removed and biopsied? You know, how definitive is the diagnosis? Right. And the reason I say this, you know, other than knowing your history a little bit, is I had a dog that I thought, a patient, a yellow Labrador, maybe 10 to 12 years old, female spade, Um, that had a very large, what felt like a lipoma on her shoulder. And I'm like, look, you know, it's, it's interfering with limb function. If it gets any bigger, we're not going to be able to talk, take it off, but we can dive in now. You know, you're probably going to have to do a lot of post-op management, keep her quiet, what have you. Seroma formation is a possibility, but, um, you know, we could get this off now. And she'll be comfortable. So they went ahead with surgery, got in there. And sure enough, you know, there was lipoma tissue, which is just fat present. But there was also this other tissue present. Yeah. And it turned out that that was a mast cell tumor. And, of course, when you have a mast cell tumor, you have histamine release. You have all sorts of problems. Mm. So, you know, I'm in there. I took out the fat. I've got this other stuff. I'm like, I just have to close this and call the owners and we'll see. And of course, you know, closing it up, multiple layers of suture and everything. But with all the histamine release, it would not, the tissues would not heal. And the leg swelled. It was pretty much a disaster. Now, a vaccine was not involved with that dog. But the reason I bring it forward is... There were two diagnoses there. There was the mast cell and there was lipoma. And, you know, visually, when you look at a lipoma, it looks like, you know, solid fat. It's kind Mm -hmm. of a ball of fat. Um, 
but this other tissue that was there. And then there was also the sheet of muscle overlying it. So you haven't fully aspirated it. You don't know exactly what it is. Uh, so to answer your question, would I consider them a candidate for vaccination? I guess I would advise and proceed with confirming everything. Have I aspirated every lump? Do I have a history that it's been there? How long? You know, right. what level of confidence do I have that I've fully sampled it? Right. Um, and of course, you're not injecting the rabies vaccine into that mass. You're putting it at an alternate site. Um, but I, you know, you proceed with caution. And any any vaccine is inflammatory in the body. Mm -hmm. uh, we use exclusively the thimerosal or mercury-free rabies vaccine, which is a little less inflammatory. Mm -hmm. but, but you can you can kick uh, any process into overdrive with the inflammatory response from a vaccine. Mm -hmm. That yeah, kind of sounds like what happened in in our case with Hank, but. Um, I did not know. I mean, I didn't know there was a mercury-free vaccine for rabies. Yeah, I believe there are actually two, but two we had to use um, MRAB three TF, which TF stands for thimerosal free. And so, one thing we've heard recently um, also is you know, when you have a dog that's a five-pound or ten-pound dog versus a fifty to eighty-pound dog. You know, we've heard some discussion in Scuttlebutt about, you know, why do you give this dogs at mm -hmm. opposite ends of the weight spectrum the same dose? Can you speak to that? I'm going off the questions. <laughs> well, I never got heard, the questions. So Because we have you heard. Surprise. What's that? I said you wanted the element of surprise when I hear that. I did. <laughs> So what is, you will hear, you will hear mm -hmm. about veterinarians who are giving half doses. You will hear about John Robb who gave half doses and lost his license for a while and lost his practice. And I guess the first thing I would put forward is uh, with respect specifically to the rabies vaccine, this is a vaccine where you're mixing science and law. Mm -hmm. So... You know, as veterinarians, as owners, as animal control officers, and anybody in between, we're all required to follow the law, which says you shall give the vaccine as directed by the manufacturer at this interval in this way. Um, doing it off-label, meaning not following the exact instructions, is a risk. And John Robb proved that very nicely when he advertised that he would give half doses to smaller pets. Oh, wow. uh, I think that was that was a very bold thing for him to do. Now, you know, he demonstrated by titers that the animals responded. I mean, his I'm not faulting his science, um, but when the law and the science disagree, the law is always going to win. And he paid he paid a high price for it. Uh, mm -hmm. with that, with that being said, you know, could you get a normal immune response to a distemper, a rabies, what have you, with a smaller dose and a smaller dog? Yes. Uh, it depends on how much of the virus, whether it's weakened virus, portion of virus, the actual antigen you're giving, because that's what vaccinates the dog. The rest mm -hmm. is just the carrier of the vaccine, what we call the adjuvant. And in many cases, that's what causes the adverse reaction. So, you know, in a small dog, do I need a full ML of fluid with genomycin, mercury, aluminum, formaldehyde, all that stuff in? No, I don't need that to irritate the immune system. A half a mil would do. But you have to concentrate the antigen into that smaller quantity. And that's not possible when you're just reconstituting a vial. Wow. So, you know, so you I guess the short answer is no. <laughs> the short answer with rabies should be no. And yeah. not that, you know, not that people don't ask us all, you know, hey, would you, 
I've had people say, well, you say you vaccinated the dog and squirt it down the sink. It's like, no, I'm not going to do that. That would be completely unethical and jeopardize my my license. Mm-hmm. You know, because you're going to go out on Facebook and say, hey, I found a vet who will vaccinate the sink and give my dog a certificate. Yeah. Um, yeah. People, people, people do crazy things. Yeah. I will. Back before we had social media and everything was on email lists, there was a vaccine group. I think it was called Novax, and they would tell you to get a blank vaccine certificate, look up some vet's name and license number, and show you how to fake it. It's like you know that's that's potentially a state or federal offense depending on where you're caught. Wow! And they they provided these for download by the owners. It was insane. Wow. Whatever happened. That is pretty crazy. And (laughs) very much appreciate your perspective on that as a veterinarian. That's very similar to what a couple other veterinarians I've talked to have said, specific to the rabies vaccine. Yeah. Um, But Pam, did you, do you have any questions that you want to ask before we, because I I don't want to take up too much of Dr. Kozier's time. I know she's a very busy person. Um, absolutely. I was just going to ask, um, can you just tell clients, the people watching, like what is absolutely required for cats and for dogs? Like, so that we don't give stuff that's really not necessary, not beneficial. What's the, what's the minimum for the maximum, you know, bang for your buck, so to speak. So, uh, the dog people can have my recommended vaccine protocol for free on the healthy dog workshop.com. Um, you can download a PDF and do that. I don't have one for cats cause it's the healthy dog workshop. Uh, but you know, at minimum you need to comply with state law for rabies, even indoor cats because bats come in your house, cats get out and the state law is not flexible. Um, I do believe that every dog and every cat would benefit from thoughtfully given with respect to timing, distemper, parvo, and for dogs, it's FBRCP, or for cats, I should say, feline rhinotracheitis, Khaleesi virus, that sort of thing. We have, fel- we have feline distemper outbreaks here, typically in the shelter. The beauty of those vaccines is they typically immunize for a very long time, if not for life. So if you time them appropriately for a puppy or kitten, don't give them too soon. Give them when they can respond fully in just two doses. So you've effectively given two doses, hopefully for that pet's life, not considering the rabies. That's pretty much my core. Um, and when we say core vaccines, by definition, that's what most animals need. Mm-hmm. Things like kennel cough, influenza, lepto, Lyme, uh, feline leukemia, uh, People used to try to vaccinate cats against, well, there was an FIV vaccine that was proven ineffective. But those are all individual use lifestyle vaccines. Yes, if your cat goes outdoors in an area where there are loads of leukemic cats, you may say, hey, I'm going to do that vaccine. The one in the practice fridge is labeled for two years, probably lasts longer. Mm -hmm. You know, for the dogs, if you're going to a kennel, you're most kennels are going to require a Bordetella vaccine, a kennel cough vaccine. We know kennel cough is not a vaccinatable disease because it's like trying to vaccinate against the common cold. There are so many causes <laughs> and the vaccine protects against one or two of them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that, that business operator, whether it's boarding kennel, daycare, grooming shop, they have to cover their butts for the owner whose dog gets sick and come, they come back complaining to them. And at least they say, hey, we did our part. We required everybody to take the vaccine. Uh, but it's as simple as that. You know, if there's no exposure, where's the benefit of vaccinating? And what's the efficacy of that vaccine in the situation? And then you make your decision. Uh, you know, I consider Lyme vaccine about 70% effective. So if I'm in a hugely tick infested area, maybe that 70% makes a difference. But Mm -hmm. if your dog gets one tick a year, is it worth doing the vaccine? Probably not. 
So it's it's case by case. Right. And um, we might as well jump into the tighter part that you started before, Janet. Okay. <laughs> um, when I say these vaccines potentially last for lifetime, I want to know that that dog's body has responded effectively. Approximately 3 to 5% of dogs will fail to respond to a parvo vaccine. The only way we can identify those individuals is to do a blood test called a titer. It measures the antibody level in the dog's bloodstream. So about three or four weeks after that final puppy shot, I would prefer to draw a blood sample, send it off to the lab, and get a measurement on that dog's antibody level. We mm -hmm. know if the dog produced antibodies, he also produced what are called memory cells. Mm -hmm. Those are the immune system cells that retain the blueprint of how to make antibodies. So it's like you're always carrying around your immune system user manual. Mm -hmm. And once you know that those cells are present in the body, you're done. You know your animal has immunity. You know you have a measured amount of antibody right now that will last for many, many years. And you know your dog's body knows how to produce that antibody. The important distinction I would make then that some vets don't, I will never titer that animal again. Some people want to titer every year. Some people want to titer every three. Um, and that's fine. You know, it's, there's no harm. It's just a blood test. But you can create confusion if that antibody level dips below the laboratory's threshold. Then what are you going to do? You're going to agonize over, should I give this dog another vaccine? You know, I personally wouldn't if I knew a previous vaccine showed an adequate antibody response. Mm -hmm. just, the dog hasn't been exposed to distemper. Why should it keep churning out antibodies to it? Mm. So it's, you know, at age 10, it's going to go below threshold. That's expected in my world. But I'm not even going to create that confusion because I'm not going to do the test. There we go. Does that make sense logical. to you guys? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It does. It absolutely yeah. does. The only, in, in my head, the only reason I could see is like, if you did find a doggy daycare or a groomer or whatever that said, I will accept your tighter test, but they want it every More three years or whatever it is. Like that, time. that in my mind would be where like, okay, that, that might That's be beneficial. A scenario that might come up and, you know, you do your best to educate that person that, mm -hmm. You know, you proved what's called immunocompetence. Mm -hmm. And I have had dogs um, that I titered after their second puppy shot that didn't have antibodies to uh, Parvo. Um, the last one I remember what happened to be a Rottweiler, which is a breed noted for not responding to Parvo vaccines. Mm -hmm. So we did give that dog, we went to another companies and other brands, Parvo vaccine just to change something up and revaccinated and then retitered. And he did come up with protective antibodies. Interesting. But you know, Interesting. we know three to five percent just don't have a good immune system. Right. right. Um, so super important to identify them. But yeah, you know, the the things that are gonna make you retiter are going to be businesses or international travel to mm -hmm. some countries. And then usually that's rabies, um, not distemper. But you're going to have to make your judgment based on the individual case, right? And awesome. and I I am encouraged by the number of boarding kennels and facilities that are willing to accept a tighter. You know, it's a whole lot better than it was, and we just need to keep pushing the message mm -hmm. that this is scientific proof of immunity, and that's an important distinction to make when you're putting forward this argument. Vaccination is defined as the act of injecting a vaccine into the animal. Immunity is defined as being immune to the disease. Correct. And vaccination does not automatically cause immunity. Mm -hmm. So the titer is superior in my book because it proves immunity. I like that. Absolutely. Well, ladies, um, did y'all want to ask Dr. Kozier anything else? I had one other thing I wanted to ask you, if you don't mind. No, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, so I recently read a Substack article from Dr. Robert Malone, and he asked the question, why we have access to human vaccine trial data, 
but not animal vaccine trial data. And the quote that I had written down is the USDA and or the NIH have no mechanism for tracking potential new vaccines, drugs, or biologics for the animal market. Um, so he was. this was in a substack he was writing about the new mRNA vaccine technology being rolled out to livestock and companion animals. Do you have concerns over this? Um, you know, truthfully, I don't know of any mRNA. You know, I don't do livestock, so I, yeah. I can't speak to that. But, um, you know, do, do, do we have access? You know, you can sign up for FDA alerts, and mm -hmm. I periodically get alerts of new drug approvals. Mm -hmm. And in that, you have generally you can download the complete uh, testing protocol and what FDA approves. So, um, you know, like they approve generics. Why we need 10 generics of Carprofen, which is Rimadyl, I don't know. But every time another company gets an approval for a generic Carprofen, I get a notice in this, it's often huge, um, list of this month's approved drugs. And you get the trial data and everything in there. Okay. So I don't know if he's speaking of prior to approval. And at that point, the company it's the company's money and they're in testing. So I would bet that's considered proprietary. Maybe there's yeah, something different on the human side that mm -hmm. it's not considered proprietary and secret until... Yeah, there was there were some issues in the I think early '80s, and I can't remember exactly what it was, but there were some lawsuits filed that that made the these pharmaceutical companies have to I, provide access to any trial data that they had going on. Um, yeah, I mean, I can see where like you do see trial data afterward mm -hmm. once FDA's approved it, but if there if it's an ongoing study. I can't imagine, I, I can't imagine on the human side, you would have to disclose it other than to whatever oversight uh, the government had in place. Mm. Uh, but there have been some nasty human trials done with vaccines and such. Um, syphilis comes to mind and where, where people were abused. And not that there aren't abusive animal studies as well, but I feel like we've made a lot of progress in not approving those studies to be conducted in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But yeah, that's that's interesting that come up with that. And I know you can you can file and any of you can file a Freedom of Information Act request on anything, you know, any product, pharmaceutical, whatever you want. Um, I don't know that you'll get anything that is in progress. Mm -hmm. But like when I did the FOIA on uh, Soresto collars, you know, I got 7,000 reports of problems in an 18 month span or something like that. Wow. It was, it was huge. And those were included human and animal problems. Um, it took a while, you know, it took a few months, but I've had other things come back very quickly. So if you're curious, Freedom of Information Act, yeah. Um, you just have to make sure you get the right agency, whether it's FDA or EPA or what have you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I was just curious as to, because you know, obviously we're seeing some not so great things on the human side with this technology. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't, I, I'm not a proponent of, you know, just randomly vaccinating everything, obviously. But, you know, there are times where you need to become immune to things. Mm -hmm. But this whole scenario was, and I don't want to be a vaccine theor conspiracy theorist or anything, but no, it's fine. the whole pandemic was a crazy time. And, mm -hmm. you know, the pharmaceutical companies were making whatever they could and products came on the market, products didn't make the market. Um, I feel like the door was open to do whatever you can because the world is going to die. And they took every road and ran with it. 
mm-hmm. for better and for worse. Yeah, true. I, I think, and I don't know about Pam and Janet, but I often get the feeling, and I, I, I talked to Dr. Josie Bug earlier this year um, about how, you know, some of these drugs will have really, really horrible side effects on the human side. And so they kind of relabel them for use in, in, with animals. And she was specifically calling out gabapentin. And that's kind of what this made me think of. Like, if we're yeah. not going to be able to continue this technology with humans, maybe we can continue it with animals. I don't know. That was yeah. kind of in the back of my mind. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I don't use a lot of gabapentin. And I think it is often used medically inappropriately. But I think there are also people who will slam a lot of drugs. And it's like, you know, actually, when you get out in the real world, like metronidazole, people are so freaking afraid of metronidazole. Truthfully, veterinary medicine pumps metronidazole out there a lot. Mm -hmm. And most dogs are fine. You know, five days of metro, they clear up their Giardia or whatever, and they go back to normal function. So we focus on the dogs that we've seen that we've had to put back together after this. I think it's important to remember, and in many cases, we work with a very small percentage of the population, and GABA is not that evil. Talk to anybody with neuropathic pain, true neuropathic pain, and, you know, look at a cat that you can't handle and you absolutely need a little bit of sedation and the owner giving some gabapentin at home lets you not shed blood or the owner shed blood. <laughs> um, I mean, it's just, it's the reality of the real world. Um, tramadol, I'm not such a fan of. And that, that was definitely overused um, in the veterinary profession for some time. And really after five days, most animals don't get any sort of response, therapeutic response to it at all because they've just acclimated. Wow. That quickly? Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Five days. And I mean, there are people, but it does, it does retain its kind of sedative effects. So people would stack it on top of an end stage for an arthritic dog. And they'd say, oh, he feels better. He's sleeping. He's so comfortable. It's like, no, he's drugged. Because, you know, for a few days, you got that extra analgesic effect, but once the body acclimated to it now. Mm-hmm. And in, I want to say, Washington Post, New York Times, one of the big papers, it's a great article about tramadol as a gateway drug to other opioids. Mm-hmm. Did you read it? It I went didn't. on. It was like a 10-page article, and it's like, wow. You know, I, this that's, is eye-opening. That's just seems logical to me. I, I want to read yeah. that. Was that a recent article? It's probably a few years old by now. But I'm, I'm sure you keep up with it. But it was in a major news, you know, something of the caliber of the Post or the Times. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Uh, yeah. To the point that the drug is not dispensed in that country or very tightly controlled. Well, in Tramadol, we used to buy Tramadol about $2.20 for a 100-count bottle. Wow. And, you know, it was dispensed, not a controlled substance. There's no record required to uh, dispense it, unlike other controlled substances, like phenobarbital for seizures. All those drugs have to be logged and accounted for from the time they come into your building to when they are dispensed to a patient. And now tramadol is as well, but you pretty much don't dispense it anymore. Thank wow. God. Yeah. Goodness I gracious. I have so many other questions. I know. <laughs> So well, I know. I I know. I you got one more. Love talking to um, you and other professionals and veterinarians because we get this like big picture of information, Mm -hmm. you know, that we can pull from so many different resources, and it's just so wonderful that Mm -hmm. um, you and others like you are so willing to to talk about it and educate pet parents because I think that's a big component of what's missing is just that Mm -hmm. if we can just talk about it and, you know, we're not allowed, not allotted that in a 15 minute (laughs) session Mm -hmm. with a patient. Right. 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 That's true. Right. I think, you know, what I heard you talking about today, Dr. Kozier is when it comes to vaccines, 
you know, we have to look at risk versus reward or, you know, maybe not reward, but benefit. benefit. Yeah. And um, I really appreciate you um, talking about your download, um, your PDF on the healthy dog mm -hmm. That's definitely something that I'm going to pull into um, my store and let people know <laughs> about that because, you know, the, there's so much, so many questions. There's so much information. As you said, Jessica, in, in a vet visit, an appointment, you don't have the opportunity to just mm -hmm. kind of ask questions. And um, this forum right here is really what I appreciate so much is that hopefully you know, we are going to reach more and more pet parents that right. just want to have that discussion um, outside of the clinic and when, so thank you very much. Oh, I, yeah. I sure. would love to talk to you about flea and tick and heartworm and you know, more nutrition. Yeah. And so, yeah, there's so much to talk about and a uh, shameless plug for my event in May. Yes. Dog Expo. Um, you know, come learn in person from my experts, my speakers and my sponsors. Yes, um, I've got I've got incredible people coming this year. When is that? In Albany, correct? Albany, yes, May twentieth and twenty first. Awesome. Um, so healthydogexpo.com. I have Dr. Barbara Royal, who you may remember from Pet Fooled. Yeah. I have Dr. Steve Marston, the Chinese oh. herb guru, and his wife. Wow. Um, Debbie, Dr. Debbie Taraka, the world's leading canine physical therapist. Okay. Is coming. Dr. Trina Haza, who is one of only four integrative oncologists in the country. Mm -hmm. And her I specialty. credit her, Dr. Kozier, for yeah. um, the, the very day that I found what we would come to know as Hank's Agasaka. Mm -hmm. um, I found it on a Sunday afternoon while I was listening to her. And. Yeah. Yes, they, there was, they were, there were two, her and Kendra another, Pope. Kendra. yes, Dr. Pope, Kendra. yes, Kendra. I was listening to them and do a webinar on integrative oncology and mm -hmm. Hank, is, he gets hurt at the fence, he comes running toward me, limping on his back leg and I go down to inspect it and I find this walnut sized mass, felt it and you know, that was August, September of last year. But my first visit to the oncologist, and we just dropped that. I think we just dropped that um, podcast on Pet Health Junkies. I was mm -hmm. listening to myself tell that story, and it was emotional for me. I have to be honest. Um, yeah. Because, you know, you have fight or flight when you're faced with something traumatic. And I definitely went into fight mode. And... So many times in life when we go through those trials, we don't, we look back and we think, how did I go through that? How did I manage to go through that? Because mm -hmm. I was, I feel like it was 24 seven. I was just in research mode and I was making appointments, whether on the phone or in person with different veterinarians. And um, the first oncologist told me that he would be dead by the holidays and that there was nothing, nothing that we could do. And so I said that I would like to consult with an integrative oncologist and asked if she knew of any, and she said there weren't any. And oh, there are, there are four. There are there four. Are four. So, well, in, in praise Jesus is here mm -hmm. in Texas and South Texas. We praise yeah. Jesus. I yep, had yep. heard Dr. Pope and Dr. Hazal that day, that same yep, day. That same day. It's that, funny how, you know, the universe, works. The universe whatever works. Whatever the universe takes care of you. But I was so thrilled when teen, Trina was so funny because I hadn't met her before. I call her up. I, I emailed her. Can we talk? Told her what I wanted her to do. Told her Kendra's a friend and, you know, uh, and she's like, okay, so you want me to come and speak? Okay, I can, I can do that. And then she said, how many, how many hours? And I said, well, probably like one, one and a half. And she's like, okay, you're going to pay for my plane ticket from California, right? I said, yeah, no problem. And your hotel. 
She said, and you're going to pay me too? I said, yeah. <laughs> and she said, for an hour? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yes. And she just, I'm like, this is not a vet conference. This is something totally different. This is for the owners. This is, you're going to impact the people you want to impact. And yeah, I'm not going to make you work too hard. Kendra's coming so you can hang out with her. Um, you know, it'll be fun. And she's like, okay, I'm in. Awesome. She's, she's wonderful. And so knowledgeable about CBD and such. Yes. And the thing I love about Kendra and her, they would never tell you your dog's going to be dead by the holidays. Right. Yeah. You know, because, because that's not their experience. They yeah. get twice, three times, four times the expected survival compared yeah. to the textbook. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was so grateful. I, was I mean, so I've got a dog that, that has, yeah, without a doubt. I've got a patient out there who probably has a bone tumor in his spine that has eaten off half of the dorsal spinous process. Mm-hmm. And he came to me, for, he went to the emergency clinic and because it was a weekend because it always is a weekend. Right. And, comes, and they told her, put him down. And she came in to me Monday and, I'm like, all right, we can try some things. And that was before Christmas. She texted me today. He's still doing well. That's awesome. And you know, I would have I would have bet loads of money against it. But no, he's doing fine. You know, he's a like, arthritic Sharpe mix. I like that you were open. That's that's what I yeah, think you have to you, do. You do. And that's what we're asking for. And we're hoping for this revival and this, you know, just as the veterinary community evolves um, to be open to other modalities Mm -hmm. and and medicines and treatments. And um, I just, I, I, I want to go girls. We're going (laughs) to healthy expo. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Oh, and I have um, Steve Brown coming with Dr. Susan Recker. Also, the guy who you know Charlie Bear treats. Oh, yeah. Steve's food. Yeah, that's yes. Yeah, that's my number one selling um, raw food in my store. Oh, really? Yeah. Yep. Steve. Um, Judy Morgan's coming with her daughter to be in this oh. sponsor area. Mm-hmm. Um, who else will you know? Gwen and um, yeah, Judy. Rodney. Uh, they were. They spoke last year. That's right. They did. So I don't, I don't think so with the new book. I mean, and they're in Portugal now, which is why I had to do inside scoop yesterday. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) They're, they're having a great time. So I don't know, you know, Karen's best friend is coming. So could Karen show up possibly, but I just know how hectic it is. Mm -hmm. But Susan Thixton's coming to hang out. there'll There'll be some really great people there both officially and unofficially. That sounds awesome. <laughs> yes, it looks awesome. So thank you again, Dr. Kozier. We yeah. appreciate you so, so yes, much. Thank you so much. And so people can find more information about you and your canine vac- recommended vaccine schedule at healthydogworkshop.com. Correct. And then yes. the expo is in May in Albany, New York, and that is healthydogexpo.com, correct? Exactly. Mm-hmm. 30th and 21st. Well, check it out. Yes, check check it out. Check it all out. Follow Dr. Kozier on socials. and She's awesome. Yeah, if you have any parting words, now's the time. <laughs> parting words. Yeah, just feed your dog food. Feed food. Mm-hmm. That's the whole thing. It makes the simplest thing you can do that will have the biggest impact. 100%. Amen. 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 <laughs> thank you so much. All right, guys. Well, yes, thank you. And from uh, Pam, Janet, Dr. Kozier, and myself, give your pets some extra love today. Talk to you guys soon.